Y'all see me okay? Okay. So this morning I just want to share a few thoughts uh, just out of the um, end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. This is a passage of scripture I've been sort of uh, mulling over for a while now. And um, it's interesting when you uh, look at the life of Jesus and you read through the Gospels, just how much uh, attention he doesn't really seem to pay to the Romans, uh, or to the political situation that's going on. He's, his uh, concern is more for what's going on within. He sees the dangers within, the dangers within the church or within the, in, in God's people. So he doesn't really, very rarely uh, engages with them, doesn't really talk about them, uh, certainly doesn't incite his followers to rise up against them. They're in the background, and that's about it uh, for most of Jesus' uh, ministry. As I, as I sort of look around and uh, see what's been happening around the world over the last couple of years and some of the crazy things that have been unfolding, <coughs> seems like the lines between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our God are becoming a wee bit blurred. And um, I think a lot of this unfolded particularly about a year ago when something like uh, 2,500 people marched on uh, Capitol Hill uh, in the United States angry about the fact that Donald Trump uh, hadn't been re-elected as, uh, as their president. And what I noticed about that is a, is a, is a number of contradictions that seem to be uh, displayed amongst the people. You had people there uh, holding up signs saying, hang Mike Pence. Other people holding up signs saying, Jesus saves. Well, I think Mike Pence needed saving that day, that's for sure. But other people, I saw another photograph, <coughs> uh, someone holding up a, a, uh, a placard and it had on it a uh, picture of Donald Trump dressed up as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger with a very heavy calibre machine gun in his hand. And, uh, and on the other hand, the guy was holding a, uh, a placard and, and on it it said, uh, make America godly again. And I'm wondering... <laughs> Is there any wonder the world's a bit confused about what the mission of the church is, about what we actually stand for anymore? And this is the world that we're living in now, and I think it's, uh, it's very relevant for, for uh, us as a church and what we're facing. And so as Jesus winds up this uh, Sermon on the Mount, <coughs> the last half of Matthew 7, he issues a series of warnings. And starting at verse 15, he says this. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn, fish, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot be a bad fruit and a, and a bad tree cannot be a good fruit. Every tree that does not be a good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit will, you will recognise them. I think what Jesus is doing here is he, he's, he's trying to point out to his listeners what the real danger is. <clears throat> this is what we need to be watching out for. Who's influencing your life? Who are you listening to? Who's the church listening to? <clears throat> And so who are these false prophets? Who are these people that Jesus is warning his followers about? And to get a bit of context to what I think Jesus is trying to get to here, I just want to back up a couple of verses back into Matthew uh, 7 verses 13 to 14. He says here, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. <coughs> I think Jesus is saying here, if you want to follow me, you've got to be prepared to walk a narrow path. See, a narrow road is a road that's either less travelled or it's difficult to, to, to traverse. It's narrow because it often has to climb up a steep hill. It can be dangerous. It can be slippery. It's the sort of path that not many people choose to go on because it's hard work, it's risky. 
And this is the path that Jesus is saying to his, pro- to his followers. This is the path that you're going to be walking if you're going to follow me. And beware of those who tell you something different. Beware of those who tell you that the path is broad, that the gates are wide, that it's smooth and easy to walk on. <clears throat> what a false prophet is, is, is really someone who misrepresents God, who misrepresents the truth. Uh, they undermine and distort it. Jesus says here in verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. The first thing we hear, that we see here is that these guys look, don't look dangerous. They look like one of us. The false prophets are not necessarily <coughs> doing anything at first glance that might seem to be dodgy or heretical. They say, they, they look and sound the same. And Jesus is saying, watch out, be careful who, you are lis- who you're listening to. Because inwardly, they're actually ferocious wolves. These men are a lot dangerous, or these women are a lot dangerous than what they look. Some of what they say <coughs> is not the truth. It may sound like the truth. It may c- they may use words out of the truth. But the way they use them and the context they use them and may not be true. <clears throat> Jesus may be referencing Ezekiel 22 verse 27 when he says, Her officials within here are like wolves, tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make, them, to make unjust gain. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. The danger with wolves getting in amongst the sheep or in the flock is this, is that they want to take the sheep out. (coughs) Some of the sheep will be taken out, they'll be eaten. Some of the sheep will be scattered from the flock. They'll run. Those that survive the dinner plate of the wolf will be wounded or bloody or 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 traumatised. The way a wolf looks at a sheep is very different to the way a shepherd does. <clears throat> Isaiah 40 uh, verse 11 says this, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. That's what a shepherd looks like. A wolf, on the other hand, looks at a sheep in a very different way. Wolf looks at a sheep the same way. I look at the sheep grazing around some of the paddocks in Oxford. Something to be fleeced and eaten. (coughs) The wolves are many and varied, and the way they go about their work is different. And I've made a list here of some of the wolves that I believe Jesus is wanting us to watch out for. (coughs) What he's trying to warn us about. So I'm just going to go through this list here and I'm going to reference a verse to each one of them and then just talk about how, just give a brief um, idea of how, uh, of how it plays out for the victims of these wolves. So the first wolf I've got here is a heretical wolf. And 2 Peter uh, 2 verse 1 says this, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. The the heretical wolf is the wolf who twists and distorts the words of God, often for their own personal agendas, or to support their own pet theologies, and sometimes even to satisfy their, their evil or their carnal nature. The victims of this wolf often fall into social or theological cults or fringe sectarian groups. The next wolf I've got here is the friendly wolf. Micah 3 verse 5 says, This is what the Lord says, As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat. The friendly, the friendly wolf tells people what they tend to want to hear. 
In other words, he's going to avoid offending people. He does this because he wants to be popular and garner a large following. The sheep are quite happy to feed this wolf because he makes them feel good. He places a big emphasis on the love and grace of God and promises wealth and prosperity. Sin, repentance, self-denial, holiness and suffering are dirty words to this wolf. This wolf so tame and friend, is so tame and friendly that even when he takes off his sheepskin, some of the sheep still think he's one of them. The victims of this wolf often embrace cheap grace and fall into sin. The next wolf I've got here is a zealous wolf. This is the wolf that thinks faith and godliness is something that should be mandated by violence or political power. He's misguided in his zeal. It often sees him engaging in behaviour that betrays the gospel. He's a modern day Judas, confused between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The victims of this wolf wolf are often end up disappointed and disillusioned. The next wolf's the greedy wolf. This wolf's an expert in fleecing the sheep. He might be the TV evangelist who promises his listeners that for every dollar they give to his ministry, God will return to it a hundredfold. He preaches what's known as the health and wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel. This wolf can fleece a sheep so fast they don't even know it's happening until it's too late. Victims of this wolf are often those who are lured by the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. Their main focus is on the here and now, not eternity. Micah 3 verse 11 says, who leaders judge for a bribe and who priests teach for a price and who prophets tell fortunes for money. The next wolf is the lying wolf. Jeremiah 23 verse 16. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill, fill you with false hopes. The lying wolf is also motivated by greed and he tends to prey on those who are weak and vulnerable. He'll promise miracles for money. He'll often tell those who are sick or desperate that the more that they give to his ministry, the more, that, more chance they will have of being healed or receiving a miracle. The victims of this wolf are, often desperate, are those who are often desperate for a miracle. <clears throat> the next wolf is the religious or the legalistic wolf. Matthew 11 verse 19, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here's a, a, glunt, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. This wolf's likely to tell you that you have to work for your salvation and sanctification. He'll often value uh, tradition and ceremony to the point where it blinds him to the truth. His values, his uh, traditions become more important than the truth. They'll often go to great lengths to avoid any possible sin and are often known more for what they don't do rather than for the fruits of the gospel, for the fruits of their faith. The, the victims of this wolf are forever striving to please God and don't feel unconditionally loved. <clears throat> then there's the self-deluded wolf. Jeremiah 14, verse 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in, lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false, vision, false visions, divinations, idolatries and the delusions of their own minds. This will slightly to have an unhealthy obsession with the spectacular. <clears throat> he might regale you with stories of all the visions and dreams that God's continually giving him. He might talk about all the trips he's been going on to heaven. The victims of this wolf often spend their lives chasing fantasies. The last wolf's the tolerant wolf. And this is no, by no means an exhaustive uh, list. 
and this is the wolf that I want to uh, spend a wee bit more time on if possible. <coughs> and I'll reference a scripture to this in a minute. But the tolerant wolf is the wolf who's willing to make a treaty with his enemies to avoid a fight or persecution, even if it means ceding some of his principles and territory. He's more concerned about what those outside the sheep pen think of him than what God does. The victims of the tolerant wolf often deny the infallibility of God's word. They'll embrace a form of progressive Christianity that broadens what the church has traditionally considered to be the truth. The victims of this wolf will be deceived into thinking that what God considers evil is good and what he considers good is, is evil. <clears throat> I think if there's a lesson too to be learned out of what Jesus is trying to say here is don't be the lone wolf. Don't, uh, sorry, don't be the lone sheep. <clears throat> don't be the sheep that thinks they're above the other sheep and doesn't need to be in the flock. Doesn't need to be in fellowship. There's safety in numbers. Stay in the pen. The lone sheep is often deceived by his own pride and it's more likely to end up on the dinner plate of the wolf. <clears throat> Most of us here have probably have traits in our character or personalities that make us vulnerable to some of these wolves. And that's why we need to be in the pen, why we need to be in fellowship with one another. <clears throat> Go down to verse 17 in Matthew 7. <clears throat> Likewise, every good, tree bear, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that, that, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. I think Jesus is trying to make the point here that outward signs of spirituality aren't necessarily what we're going to be judged on. <clears throat> the gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't what Jesus is really looking for. So what does a real prophet look like? How do we tell the difference between the good and the bad fruit? One of the things I've noticed over the years is when you compare some of those in the contemporary Christian church who consider themselves to be the prophets and compare them with the Old Testament prophets, there seems to be quite a large disparity between not only their lifestyles but what they preach. <coughs> The Old Testament prophets, the role of the Old Testament prophets was to keep God's people and leaders accountable. It was to call out sin and idolatry. It was to remind them of the obligations to the poor and the needy. Warn them of God's coming judgment. When I look at today, some of today's prophets in the church, I see those who have uh, enormous amounts of wealth Preach a, a, tend to preach a message that people want to hear. They're, rich, they're, itching people's, tick, they're tickling people's itching ears. <clears throat> you think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah spent his entire ministry warning God's people and the leaders of God's <clears throat> and the leaders of God's people about the coming judgment that if they didn't repent of their sin, turn back to God, observe the Sabbath gave the land rest that he was going to take them into captivity in Babylon. <clears throat> Jeremiah spent most of his life hiding, if, well, not hiding, but avoiding, <clears throat> in some cases, the threats of death that not only the king, but others were threatening against him. Zedekiah told him not to come 
come anywhere near him unless he had, uh, had some good news to tell him. Later on, he threatened him with death. <coughs> Prophet Isaiah upset the evil king Ahab so much with his preaching that Jewish tradition has it that he squeezed him into a hollowed-out tree log and had him sawn in two. <coughs> Prophet Hosea was asked to marry a, prof uh, a prostitute. Probably not as ideal of a dream girl, but it was to be a, a prophetic sign to the nation of Israel of their own unfaithfulness to God. Elijah had to resort to support from an impoverished widow. So these are the men <coughs> who God had called. And if you were called into the prophetic ministry in Old Testament times, it, it was almost a death sentence. Getting back to the tolerant wolf for a minute. <coughs> Exodus 34 verse 12 and verse 15 say these. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, for they will be a snare to you. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for they will prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them. They will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. I've just been reading a, uh, or rereading a book that I read a number of years ago uh, about the uh, story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and pastor during uh, Hitler's rise uh, in the 1930s. Dietrich Bonhoeffer refused to bow the knee to Hitler. <coughs> What's interesting about what unfolds in the German church can be seen really in, in, in what Jesus and what this uh, what we've just read here in Exodus. So what the Nazis wanted to do, they wanted to obliterate the German church because there was no place for a a, a church or a religion that had Jewish roots. Many in the German church were desperate to save the church, so they offered, they offered the Germans a treaty. We will embrace some of what you want us to embrace if you leave us alone. <coughs> of course, this had tra tragic uh, consequences. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and some of his uh, fellow pastors split from the church and set up what was called the Confessing Church remained faithful to the gospel and in the end paid, some of them paid, paid, with, paid, uh, paid for that faithfulness with their lives. <coughs> I think today's prophets really are those, uh, are the pastors and the ministers of our churches like Greg and Ian who get up Sunday after Sunday faithfully preaching God's word irrespective of what the society or the society outside is telling them that they should preach. Because what the false prophets want to do <coughs> is they want to rip the gates off the hinges. They want to pull up the posts and they want to broaden that narrow road. They want to make what God has forbidden permissible. And that's the battle that we have as a church and that the church has in general. <clears throat> verse 24 of uh, Matthew 7 therefore anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock but anyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell like a great and it fell with a great crash. This is the very last part of Jesus' sermon on the mount, and it's what he uses to cap it all off. 
And I think what Jesus is saying here is it's the Jesus that you're building your house on, the Jesus of the Old Testament prophets. Or is he the Jesus of the false prophets? When the storms come, and they surely will, <clears throat> and to be honest, the world's in a storm at the moment, and so, and so is the church in general. When the winds subside and the, the, the waves go back out to sea, <clears throat> and the winds stop, will the Jesus that you've been building your life on still be there, or will he be found wanting? And this is what Jesus is saying. Who are you building your life on? Are you paying attention to the building code? <clears throat> Who are you listening to? I'm going to finish up now and just hand back to Greg, but the question, and this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Which Jesus are we building our life on and who are we listening to? Are the people you're listening to, are your favourite are your favourite preachers the calling you to a life of uh, holiness, self denial, repentance? Or are they calling you to or are they or are they telling you the things that your itching ears want to hear? And Jesus is saying, Beware of the prophets. Don't let yourself be swept out to sea. Amen.